understood thing from this morning, downgrade Americano. <laughs> I'm already a bit in a depressed state, but I'll try to get out of it here pretty quickly. Um, two other things to say, first of all, uh, I think current Google customers and partners in the room, first of all, thank you for your business. We appreciate Secondly, I wanted to thank, um, this is my first time to Argentina, to Buenos Aires, and it's a beautiful city. Everyone's been very nice, so thanks for your hospitality. Um, I talked to Adriana prior to this event, and she wanted me to come here, um, and I'm actually going to Mexico tomorrow to do a similar presentation, um, to talk about this concept that we're starting to socialize in the United States uh, and globally called the zero moment of truth. I'll explain it in a second, but the concept overall is uh, like Joseph said and others have said, um, you're seeing much more activity before folks get to the storefront, before folks go online to, to purchase a product, before folks go to a car dealership. You're seeing a lot of activity early on in, uh, online in the research process. We'll talk through some research that we've done, et cetera. Um, but a lot of kind of big changes have happened both in the, in the world, in the economy, and with technology that have uh, precipitated this. And I'll walk you through a little bit of that. And thanks for having me. So we've had some issues in the US the last couple of years, uh, and, and perhaps other economies has, have had, had them as well. Hopefully we will not go into a, a double dip recession here. I, I think we'll um, hopefully be okay. But Basically what happened is, as Joseph had said as well, the consumer is, is, has changed, and they've changed dramatically. Uh, it's a total change in consumer behavior. We're seeing much more activity uh, online and in various other parts of the ecosystem before folks actually make a purchase, if they indeed even do make a purchase. They have to be much more cost conscious, they have to look for choice, they have to look for quality. And the way technology has changed, I'll outline in a second, there's much less friction in that research process. So the first element of major change uh, is present. The consumer has changed, they're in charge. But what also has changed dramatically is technology. So when I talked about kind of a frictionless system, now it's much easier to get that information for the consumer to be in charge based on some of these fundamental changes. So 10 years ago, in 2000, 2% of the world's population was online, 2%. Right now it's about 25%. We expect 5 billion worldwide internet users over the course of the next 10 years. That's fundamental change, and it's, and, and it's caused by technology. From a mobile perspective, we, have 10 we expect 10 billion global cellular subscribers over the course of the next 10 years. Multiple units, multiple um, devices per, per person. And these devices will be fast, they'll be powerful, they'll be a laptop in your pocket, and they'll be much more, add much more value than just having, a, than just your current cellular plan, your current laptop. That's going to change things significantly. And then probably most importantly, uh, exabytes and zettabytes probably don't mean much to you. Um, the simple concept being that Every bit of information out there in the world most likely will be digitized. And, the, and, and that's important because the speed at which we transmit the, this digital information is going to increase by 2,000 times. So the wi I did the math. The Wi-Fi connection in the four seasons today, the speeds that we'll be transmitting this digital information in 10 years will be 2,000 times faster. So there's a, a lot you can do when technology moves that quickly and there's no friction in the system. So what happens? What happens when the consumer is changing, when technology is, technology is changing, you have significant numbers of consumers going online, looking for information, and you as marketers have an opportunity to influence those buying decisions well before they're actually in the store. The hard part about this is this, it's getting increasingly, increasingly complicated on the path to purchase. We work with a professor at the Wharton School of Business, Professor Jerry Wynn, and he wrote this book called uh, Making, Making Better Sense, this concept of mental models and breaking through mental models, and that what, that's what really causes change in various different industries. 
He's got this story in the book about the four-minute mile. From the dawn of civilization to 1954, no human could run a mile under four minutes. Everyone thought it was impossible. There was a model in people's heads that, ju that just said it couldn't be done. Now, there wasn't technology or anything else that got Roger Bannister over that four-minute mi four barrier. In May of 1954, he ran it in, in three minutes and 49, 49 seconds. It was a mental model that he had in his head that said, I can do it. Now, what's more interesting about that story is in the three years after, 16 other runners ran it under four, four minutes. So this concept, this barrier, this mental model was shattered, and it opened up a whole new set of opportunities within this particular industry. And the professor talks about how various different industries have moved forward at a, a very quick pace based on the breaking of some of these mental models. So let's try to take that to the marketing model. We know that the key to winning any industry from a, um, from a marketing perspective and from a business perspective is building a great product. That won't change, it hasn't changed. Uh, all the successful businesses that are out there today are winning based on a good product. Uh, and the ones that fail, they, might, they, may, they may be super successful early on, everyone kind of thinks they're great, but unless they have a sustainable, awesome product, they're probably not gonna survive. So that hasn't changed. What also continues to be important is you have to provide the stimulus. You have to advertise. You have to pe get people off of their couch during a football game into a store to actually buy something. It's still a critical part of the economy. It's a critical part of all of your plans. You have to build the stimulus to drive folks to use that great product that you've built. And then lastly, kind of the third part of the mental model, of, uh, the current mental, traditional mental model of marketing is in the store. Once you actually get them to the store, can you close them? Do you have the right packaging? Do you have the right message? Is it the right place on the store? Whether it's a grocery aisle or a car dealership or a travel agency. About uh, in 2005, the Wall Street Journal wrote an article about this concept. Procter & Gamble, one of the largest advertisers and CPG companies in the world, coined this concept called the first moment of truth. The first moment of truth in their eyes was the time when the, the mom or the shopper was at, in the grocery aisle and there was about a three to sec, seven second time process that they would make their decision about their product purchase. So all of the advertising, all of the research, all of the activity in P&G's back office in Cincinnati was focused on winning at that first moment of truth. The second moment of truth is when that mom, that shopper, took the toothpaste home, the kids used it, everyone was happy. That's what really counted. But to get that person to actually connect with the product, buy the product, that was what they, that was the kind of the nexus of all of their advertising activities was in that aisle, that first moment of truth. So this is the traditional mental model of marketing then. You've got your stimulus, You've got the first moment of truth when you drive folks and you have to convince them right then to then purchase the product, take the product home, use it. That's your second moment of truth. Relatively traditional model. We've got all of our budgets, all of our organizations built around this concept. And for the most part, there haven't really been kind of any interrupters in that, in that process. With the exception of a few of these things, I don't know if you have this kind of concept or have had this concept in Argentina. But we have consumer reports and Zagat for the restaurant reviews where over time, every once in a while, there would be these, um, uh, these products that would allow someone to do research before they actually decided to buy a product. The problem was, and my father still has these um, boxes and boxes of old consumer reports uh, that he still goes back to and, and, and uses. Um, the, the problem is there was so much friction in that system. You'd go to the library, you'd check out consumer reports if you didn't, uh, if you didn't already buy it. It just wasn't very efficient. So it really didn't challenge kind of this traditional model of marketing. But now things have changed dramatically. With what we talked about in the economy, coupled with technology, you see a huge surge in buyer behavior online. Whether it's queries for for couponing or reviews, you see much more activity happening well before the first moment of truth. 
Here are some statistics that we've recently run and done from some research that suggest almost 80% of internet users in the US are going online to search for information to move from an undecided to a decided consumer. 32% have actually posted reviews. That's significant. Folks are actually offering up advice on a product that they've used to the next consumer who's starting to do this type of research. Uh, when you get to these numbers, that's material and it's going to change a traditional model of marketing. You also see folks actually finding these reviews useful. On average, a user in the US is reading four to seven, four to seven product reviews before they start feeling comfortable. And they're not reading these, these reviews on Consumer Reports or Zagat. They're doing a search on Google or Bing or Yahoo. They're watching a video on YouTube and they're forming their decisions well before they, get, they actually get to the aisle. So of a hypothesis we've put together over probably the last six to nine months in the US at Google is this concept of the zero moment of truth. The concept that there's a significant amount of information gathering happening well before the first moment of truth and requires uh, a whole change in how you approach um, kind of your traditional path to purchase uh, that you set up for, for your particular purchaser, your particular consumer in your industry. And like any good kind of research-based, engineering-based organization, we wanted to test that hypothesis. So this is a busy slide. I'll distill it down for you in a second. What we did is we reached out to a third-party research firm. We talked to 5,000 purchasers in 11 different categories, CPG, finance, uh, voters, in fact, B2B, and we tried to better understand what forms and sources of information get them from an undecided shopper to a decided shopper. What influences the decisions that they make? And then we organize the results into those three elements of that marketing model. Was it at that stimulus? Did they watch a TV ad? Did they read a magazine? Did they see an out-of-home billboard? And did that help them begin to form a decision and an opinion on what they would do? Did they go on Google and do a, do a search? Did they read reviews? Did they talk to friends? Or were they actually in the store aisle and they made their decision then? And we categorized all of these responses into one of those different elements. And we found that the hypothesis that we had was indeed valid, that almost a, Equally, in fact, a little bit more, but equally, ZMOT, the zero moment of truth, was kind of on equal footing as those other elements of the, of the traditional marketing model. Uh, and I'll walk through with you probably most, what the most important element is, is how you actually optimize. How do you win at that zero moment of truth? But I think the first part is just actually believing that this is true. If you don't believe our research, and I'll walk you through a little bit more, do your own. Make sure you're looking at all your internal data, your internal statistics to better understand how your purchasers, how your shoppers are forming their decisions. I suspect you'll find similar results then, and it will cause you to have to do some things differently in the communication, the engagement, the marketing you do with potential shoppers. So, so let's break down a little bit the, that equal fourth moment, the zero moment of truth. Clearly search engines, again, whether it's Google, Yahoo, Bing, um, are going to have influence here, both in the organic side as well as paid. So it's an obvious place to, to engage with, with those potential consumers starting to make their decision. But you can see lots of different information here. Comparison shop in, shopping engines, retailers' websites, product reviews and endorsements online. These are things that you, that you may be participating in, you may not. But you need to know this is how purchasers are now starting to form their opinions and make their decisions. So you can probably do two things. One, you can watch it happen. Or two, you can engage and participate and try to, to fish where those fish are. Play where consumers are starting to form their decisions. What we also want to make clear, though, is there's um, an integration with all these various different point, points of, uh, within the model within the funnel. And it's really not even a funnel anymore. It just, uh, it's kind of like a neuron and, and it's shooting out in various different areas and everything is influencing every part of that model. So we've, we've done a lot of research, especially around moms because CPG is an area and the mom's audience is one that we continue to see more activity online. 
And we found that in some of the internal and external research we did, that obviously lots of activity is driven from offline advertising, specifically TV. So you don't just have the stimulus, then the first moment of truth, they're all integrated. And a lot of times the ZMOT moments are driven off of the stimulus and the, and the television ad or radio ad, et cetera. So it's very critical that you kind of have an integrated plan in mind. And what's taken on even more significance recently is mobile. This is a, a, a month and a half old slide, a two month old slide, my apologies. The number is actually 500,000 plus. That's how fast this is growing. This is how fast it's growing. This is the same slope that we first saw in search when Google launched 13 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's actually starting to accelerate a bit. So the fact that you now have a device that you're probably in the aisle, in the store aisle, and you're making decisions, and your ZMOT is actually happening in the store aisle is another example of how this is all inter inter intertwined and integrated. Uh, and it's not just this kind of funnel and straightforward one, two, three step model. Look at some of these statistics, and the one that I think is most impressive, or most actually a bit scary if you're a marketer, is the last one. So on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, 20% of all queries on Google, of all activity on Google, um, came from a mobile phone. I mean, that, that, that's staggering. That means a couple of things. Number one, folks are, are in, in the shopping experience, they're in stores, and they're searching. That was a year ago. So let's, let's think what it's going to be now. So the concept again here is you have to recognize there's a new model. The model is not as linear as traditional models have been. And you've now got new technology that's probably going to change this model yet again in the next couple of years. But it's a great opportunity to start engaging at what we are calling this zero moment of truth. I want to walk through a quick video that will give you a little bit more uh, information on this particular concept. Translated. Can you turn up the volume? Stimulus like radio, TV, and print to drive awareness of our product or service, which would then drive people to the point of sale uh, at retail or at shelf, for example, uh, whereupon hopefully they would choose your product or service, take it home, and have a great product experience. Zero moment of truth is that moment that increasingly is growing in importance that gets in between your stimulus and your point of sale. To some degree, consumers aren't doing anything differently than they have been doing for years. They have been gathering information about what's going to be the best product and where it is that they should be buying and they've been trying to learn about that before they make their decision. What has changed is where they gather that information, their ability to easily collect some of that information from a multitude of sources, and their ability to compare from one alternative place to buy versus another. Today, the number one spot where shoppers begin their journey is search. 70% of all transactions we're seeing some sort of pre-shopping take place, even if it's for items that cost a dollar or less. Zero moment of truth isn't just a catalyst that starts shopping, but it starts learning. And I think the biggest change that we see is shoppers that walk into every transaction saying, I want to be smarter, I want to be more informed, I want to make better choices, and yeah, I also want to save some money. We find this zero moment of truth, it applies across all of our customer bases, whether you're buying a big jet engine, whether you're buying a refrigerator, or whether you're purchasing a credit card. It really does apply both in a consumer and in a business-to-business -business context. But think about it. It's a natural behavior. It's a way that we all now make our buying decisions almost uh, as second nature. Typically what we would all do is we would try to get some more information between seeing the stimulus and showing up at the shelf. And it's those moments in collection that we call the zero moments that need to be part of your marketing plans. So what's actually more important, so let's step back one second. Let's assume that what I, I just said made some semblance of sense. Um, maybe it's a language barrier, but just pretend like you believe what I just said. Uh, you understand the hypothesis, that's great. The, mo the more important part is how do you actually leverage this? How do you win at the zero moment of truth? 
Um, I've been at Google five years. I work with big customers in the local space, in the B2B space, in the public sector, the government in the U.S. And um, we're, we're talking to customers, CMOs, CEOs like yourself every, every day in the U.S. And these seven different strategies are things we've seen some of our more progressive customers, some of our folks who have, have um, engaged with this concept of the zero moment truth that built out their digital organizations. These are best practices that we're seeing in the states that I thought might be interesting for you guys here um, because I do think they're working for a lot of these customers and uh, they're able to actually engage with this new consumer who is in charge at a more relevant, more impactful time in that, in that process than, than kind of the traditional stimulus, first moment of truth, second moment of truth. So the first concept is put someone in charge. Relatively basic, but you'd be surprised how many companies just haven't gotten here yet. Um, at Procter & Gamble, they actually named a director of the first moment of truth eight years ago. Uh, and they put their, their, their organization, their budget behind that concept. We've seen handfuls, that's about it, so far, kind of formally say, listen, this is a, this is a, a, a major focus area of our company. We're going to organize around it. Most of the other companies recognize digital is important. They've got a strong digital agency. They've worked with their traditional agency who's built up their digital experience. They've hired a smart digital operator who's in charge, but it's still relatively siloed. So you'd go to the CMO and you'd say, well, who's in charge of your advertising, your, your stimulus? They'd know exactly who it was. There's a budget, it's tangible. Who's in charge of your your uh, in aisle, your, your store experience. They have someone in charge, they have a budget, and then who's in charge of research to figure out at the second moment of truth what, how consumers are responding to your product. A whole organization there. But when you ask them who's in charge of going out there on the web and understanding what the conversations are, how are you playing in those conversations, how are you influencing that decision that's now at equal to the first and the second moments of truth in that stimulus. And that's what I think uh, we're going to need to really start to, to, to put this in action, is people who are accountable, as well as the budgets behind it, to actually affect and win at this zero moment. The second element we've, we've encouraged companies and many are starting to do is to identify and find your zero moments in your particular industry. So after this conference, or Honestly, probably um, many of you will do it now on a smartphone or an iPad uh, or a tablet. Go to Google and type in these three queries. Type in your brand. Before you can even press search, everything will show up, like we just talked about with Google Instant. And you'll see how your brand is being talked about, both or organically and with either in perhaps competitors in advertising. But more importantly, then type review after your brand and see what people are talking about, where they're talking about it. And maybe even more importantly, type in best before your product category or your industry. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about at the zero moment of truth. It will be comparison sites. It will be product reviews. It will be complaints from customers. And it won't just be text websites. It'll be videos uh, that, that are even more impactful than just words on a page. So start to better identify what those zero moments are for your particular organization, uh, and then you can optimize around them. But if you don't know where you're starting from, you're in trouble. And then start answering the questions that people are actually asking. This is a customer of mine, 3M in the US. They're a huge conglomerate, global conglomerate. They make office supplies, uh, but that's just one of probably 50 different in industries they operate in. Here's a query that says, that someone has raised their hand, it's the same as calling an 800 number, and said, listen, I want more information on 3M office supplies. It's not even just office supplies, it's 3M office supplies. So the stimulus already got them to do a search on 3M office supplies. But look how they respond back. It's a little bit of kind of a vague message. Uh, you can buy products here, adhesive, tapes, abrasives, cleaners, and more. I don't care about any of that other stuff. I just want 3M office, office supplies. So take me to the exact page, give me the exact message on office supplies, because that's what I'm asking for. And this doesn't take a lot of work. Uh, any keyword campaign can be set up to match exactly the query, and you can have tons of different testing and swap out messages. You can have multiple links underneath to take them on to various different elements of your site. 
answer the questions that people are actually asking, and you'll engage them at the z zero moment of truth uh, a little better, a little bit easier, a little bit more quickly. Begin to optimize for it. So everyone understands kind of paid, earned, owned, and shared. This earned concept of, the, of your marketing budget takes on major significance with the zero moment of truth. So all of a sudden, when you post a video and maybe put some marketing behind it, it can take off. It's more, more of our video views oftentimes happen off of YouTube than actually on YouTube because they're sent an email, they're posted to Facebook, they're posted to other sites. That's all earned. Once you get it out there, once you build the creative, it takes off. It's shared. It's complimented. It's reviewed. So understand this whole concept and start to optimize your creative resources against it. The other element on the mobile side is you have a huge opportunity on mobile. It's material. Over 20% of the queries right now on Google.com are mobile queries. Probably within the next 24 months, that'll be 50-50. 50 percent of all queries on Google, of all people raising their hand and asking a question, will happen on a mobile smartphone as opposed to a PC. That changes the game. Everything we're doing at Google, everything we engineer, everything we build, we're building for mobile first because we know that's the way it's going. It's not, mobile isn't, this isn't the year of mobile. Um, last year was the year of mobile. It, we don't have to talk about it anymore. It's here. It's extremely material. But now optimize it. We did this analysis and found that only 20 percent Two out of every 10 of our largest advertisers in the US, this might even, uh, might even be a global number, don't even have a mobile optimized website. That's core blocking and tackling. That's the easy stuff. Let's make sure that you're, you're optimizing for the platforms that are critical in the zero moment of truth. We're eating our own dog food. We're doing this exact same thing. We recognize that zero moment of truth this concept of reviews, commenting, sharing your experience applies to search as well. And we've been delayed in, in, in engaging. So we launched this concept of plus one so that whenever you're doing a search, when you're ever on our website, if, that, if you like that search, if you like that website, if it's worked for you, you plus one it so that the next time someone comes and does a search for the Grand Hotel in Madrid and, and a friend of yours in your network has plus one that site, you've passed on a zero moment of truth, actually your second moment of, of truth to someone else and it's become their zero moment of truth. So someone goes and does a search, they find a website, it appeals to them, they're in your network, they plus one it. The next time you do a search, you'll see that my friend, Mark, whomever, plus one this site all of a sudden, that particular site, that entry, that listing, whether paid or organic, has much more relevance to you because your social network, your graph has suggested this is relatively useful. So we're trying to practice what we preach on the Google side, too, from a zero moment of truth perspective. You can optimize for this stuff. Adriana talked about this a little bit, so did Joseph, about being nimble, being fast. This is, a, this is a great example. So I don't know if anyone, uh, this is a popular TV show in the US, The Colbert Report. Uh, it's kind of a satire on the news. Um, it's funny, it's, but it's, and, and actually a lot of people get, un, unfortunately, maybe this is the problem with America, a lot of people get their news from these types of, con these types of shows. Um, but during this particular show, Stephen Colbert was making fun of an offline advertising campaign that Miracle Whip was doing. They were, Miracle Whip is trying to be more edgy, get to a, a younger demographic, and so they had this campaign that said, don't be so mayo. It was kind of cheesy, and uh, Stephen Colbert picked up on it. But was, what was interesting was before the next day uh, came out, uh, Miracle Whip had actually run a search campaign riffing off of what had just happened on the Stephen Colbert show. So knowing that oftentimes Colbert clips get shared on YouTube, get sent around, it's, it's the virtual water cooler. Miracle Whip engaged. They built a whole campaign knowing that folks are probably going to be online talking about that particular uh, clip on, uh, on the Colbert show. And they created a whole campaign around it and said, well, you know, you heard Stephen Colbert, which side are you? Are you Mayo or are you uh, Miracle Whip? That kind of thing. Again, a little, a little interesting, a little edgy, but it took off. And now, actually, most of the traditional advertising that Miracle Whip is doing is around this kind of concept on which side of the brand and of the product.
for Su Yuan, and it's been relatively effective. But it all started just based on an insight that they found. They didn't plan this. This wasn't a product placement on the Colbert Show. It was just picked up. But they were able to be nimble, they moved fast, and they took advantage of it. So at this zero moment of truth, when these types of things start to happen, you've got to make sure you engage quickly. Video, we've talked about this. The second, um, the, the, the second most searched website in the world right now is YouTube. So there's more searches on YouTube than any other site uh, other than Google. Uh, now there's a ton of content there. We need to do a better job of actually surfacing content. I think about 36 to 45 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. So there's tons of video. But a constant objection I get from customers is, yeah, but it's just the, the dog on the skateboard. Um, it, it's not relevant content for, my, content for my particular industry. So I do this test with them. So this was an, actually an example. I was with, the, um, with one of the divisions of General Electric. And they had that same objection. Very traditional kind of uh, corporate um, um, company, GE. In this particular division, the aviation division was like, listen, not relevant. So I went online, I did a search for commercial jet engines on YouTube, and I had 837 results. And this, was, this wasn't a dog driving an airplane. <laughs> these, were, these were various different videos, thought leadership pieces, uh, videos from various different events, um, uh, even some how-to videos for, for like small propeller kind of things. Interesting content that was very specific to that particular industry. That's just one. You do that for your own company, I guarantee you'll find something very similar. So make sure, I mean, video is probably the, even the, the most impactful element of the zero moment of truth because you can tell stories, you can be engaging, you have sight, sound, and motion, you can be real, and it doesn't take a, a huge expense. You don't, in fact, on YouTube, it's actually probably not as relevant if it's this big, glossy production. Make it real, make it one-to-one, -one, and you'll probably have more impact. And then lastly, jump in. Uh, you heard a couple comments uh, this morning about fail fast. That's one of the mantras at Google. Um, and I think it's relatively relevant for this time uh, in, in the internet ecosystem and in the marketing ecosystem. Everything is changing so quickly. If you don't get out there and test various different things, you don't have to move your entire budget somewhere or change everything you're doing. But if you don't engage, you don't test, you don't iterate, you're probably going to miss some of these huge cycles which will have a huge impact on your business. Uh, so we've asked customers, and they've followed, many without even talking to us, obviously, uh, and they've engaged, they've jumped in, and they've built organizations around this concept of the zero moment of truth, and they're seeing results. We actually wrote a book about this whole concept where we give you lots of detail on those 11 categories, the research we did, lots of videos from other CMOs uh, worldwide talking about this concept. So if you have an Android or anything else, just go. Um, I'll leave this up after my presentation. Download it or go to zeromomentoftruth.com and you can find a lot of this content, uh, things that I couldn't push in a 30-minute in a presentation, but are, that are pretty interesting, and you can just forward along to your organization and you might find it useful. But I'll leave you just with this uh, challenge on what are your plans to engage in this zero moment of truth. And the challenge for, for all of you is, chances are if I'm asked back next year, hopefully I will, it's a great city, I'm having a good time, um, I, I will walk you through a whole new set of sea changes that have happened. Uh, the, the silver bullet in digital is when, let's pretend this is a phone, when I can get an offer on my phone, it drives me to a store, I can find that particular item, I can pay with my phone, and I can activate that offer, and it remembers all my loyalty information from that store. It sounds sci-fi, but that's actually happening now. We've partnered, uh, we've built a thing called Google Wallet. We've partnered with a handful of retailers and credit card companies to test this. It's out there, it's in beta, and I guarantee you that that uh, will make significant process one year from now. And that will have even more implications on this whole concept of the zero moment of truth. So we're only at the first second inning of this entire thing, which is why I skip to work every day and it's a tremendous amount of fun. But I recognize for CEOs and CMOs of large organizations, it's a challenge, it's tough. 
um, use us, ask us questions, get data from us, whether you use us for advertising or not. Honestly, we don't care. We're in this for the long term and we want to help. Uh, and you have teams on the ground here in, in Argentina and elsewhere in South America and in Latin America that can, that can help you get through this. Uh, and we'd love to participate with you. So thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. Couple minutes for Q and A, or do we want to move to the very next um, couple minutes of Q and A? So I think there, if there is any microphones or any interest in there out there on Q and A, why don't we do that? So can someone get this gentleman a microphone here? Hey. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for a great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I was thinking about the future, and I was wondering if the first moment of truth is not going to vanish. I mean, why not get the offer on the phone, buy it, pay it, and get it at home? Why do I even need to go to the store? So yeah. I don't know what will happen with stores in the future. And that's my worry because I study retailing, so <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm wondering. I, I think Thanks. it's a great question, and I do think online retailing and online commerce it obviously has already grown significantly. There's still more to go. Uh, but in many industries, that store experience is still critical. I think that will continue, but it will be a different experience. It might be more of testing things. It might be getting some final questions answered. It might be comparing various different things. Um, it, it, because all of the data that you now have at your fingertips going into that store, it informs you so much more. It's going to be very similar to a car dealership. So at least in the US, and I'm assuming similar here in Argentina, when I or my wife or my friends walk into a car dealership, they have a printout that says, this is the exact car I want, that I know this is how much it costs you, this is how much I'm willing to pay, and I have five other sites and other dealerships that, that, will, um, that will sell it to me at this price. So there's virtually no haggling. Uh, and the pressure is then on the dealership to provide the right experience on service uh, and other things to, to get you as a customer. So I suspect it will be very similar to that where your value proposition as a merchant will just change a bit and you're going to have to do a few different things in store. But I, I have to assume that, that in store won't go away, but I guarantee you that the percentage of goods sold online for a big real t retailer versus the percentage sold in store will continue to, you know, to balance out. Enjoy the rest of the